Hi, I'm Kimberly Davis, and I'm the Fiscal Feminist. Welcome to a very special edition of my podcast, um, because today I am going to be interviewing my new husband, Mark Powell, and um, we are going to be discussing uh, how he feels about the Fiscal Feminist and various things that I write about as my significant other. So welcome, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming today. Um, as you can hear, Mark is English, so uh, he's actually not making that up. That really is his accent. Um, he's not trying to be funny or anything, although... It's he, actually the he, best fake English <laughs> accent I can do. <laughs> he might try to be funny <laughs> later, so I'm already asking for apologies on that one. Um, but anyway, thank you for coming today. And before we get started, ha- happy birthday. It is your birthday today. Um, and thank you very much. I appreciate that you... We're willing to come here today to do this on your birthday. So um, I just want to say a few things um, as so that I can lay the foundation about the Fiscal Feminist in case you haven't heard or haven't followed. But um, basically, it is a platform that I have started, a thought leadership platform to encourage women to take control of their finances and to be knowledgeable about their finances and to have a voice in whatever financial relationships that they have with their significant others, friends, parents, et cetera, uh, you know, uh, employers and so on and so forth. So um, as I mentioned, Mark and I got married on August 7th, so a little over a month ago. And we had to make some changes because of COVID, but we did, and we had a great wedding, and it was fantastic, and my daughters attended, and we all had just a great family time. So um, I thought it would be really interesting to bring Mark in today, and for him to, and we haven't rehearsed any of this, so some of this stuff I'll be hearing for the first time myself, but to, you know, really get his uncut version of his thoughts on all the stuff that, uh, you know, I write about and also negotiating our prenuptial agreement and so on and so forth. But before we get into all of that, um, Mark, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're from England. We know that. So um, tell us where you're from, when you came here and what you do and all that stuff. Well, thank you, Kim. Um, So, yes, I'm from England and I moved to America in 1987. Uh, I was working in the advertising industry then, for Saatchi and Saatchi, so they bought a company in New York, and I came here with my then um, fiance Diane, and um, we were sort of a husband and wife, wife creative team, I was a creative director, she was a um, account director, um, and uh, fell in love with New York, so we were based in New York, and then um, moved to LA to open an office. And we worked together. And um, interestingly, um, when I met you, <laughs> you kind of reminded me a little bit of Diane because she's very independent, very successful. Um, and um, I, I, I admired that a lot. So you, so know, you like a, strong women. I love strong women. <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, that really goes back to um, my upbringing. My mother's very, very... A uh, strong woman. Um, yes, your so, mom. Your mom is a tough cookie, a very intelligent, uh, straight shooter. Very tough, um, but very caring, very loving, and uh, so you know that um, that's something which uh, I think in your, you know, in your childhood uh, shapes your your philosophy, you know, and your thinking about uh, gender uh, equality. I suppose um, my mother and father, you know, discussed everything, and they were very. Um, a great sense of humor, very smart people. And um, I never saw any sort of imbalance between between them, you know, uh, growing up. Which is up. saying something because generationally that's a, you know, a different generation. So just to be clear, I'm not your first wife, correct? <laughs> <laughs> so how many wives have you had? Let's just get that out of the way. Well, now I've had three. I'm the third. Um Rumor has it I'm related to Henry VIII, so... <laughs> but please, I'm, I'm please gonna, don't take my head off. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stop at three. Okay, well, let's hope that the third time is the charm. Um, so, as a... It's always interesting to me because I um, lived in England, as you know, for almost 
I guess, 13 and a half years. And I didn't know Mark in England. I met him here. Um, but I've often thought about the differences in culture um, between the English and Americans vis-a-vis, you know, women and women's rights and how, you know, men view women. Are they more liberal? Are they, you know, more, uh, do they embrace the feminist idea more? I I don't know exactly. I think it's a little more traditional there. But um, what do you think? Do you think there's a difference in the way uh, men are in England as opposed to the United States? Uh, Yes, I do. Um, I remember when I was, you know, in college, actually, it was probably the first experience up in London um, at Central St. Martins. We had international students, and the Americans always, you know, both the men and the women, loud. Um, um, <laughs> Excuse me? Fun. <laughs> no, but, you know, the Brits are kind of quiet, you know, um, uh, unless they've been down the pub. Um, but uh, generally speaking, Americans are out. Except outs- if they're at football games. Right, right. Um, so they have their certain. Uh, environments where they, you know, have, I guess they have their their sort of, um, their outlets for expressing themselves. But generally speaking, um, day-to-day Brits are quiet. Um, And and being amongst Americans in London, um, you know, I I warm to their energy, you know, and their spirit. They're very competitive. And uh, this is interesting, but, you know, we've never discussed this before, really. But um, I thought the women were really strong. You know, I was a bit intimidated by American women. They were really strong. And a lot of the um, activities I got involved uh, in, say, for example, I was part of the London University kayak team. And uh, it was, uh, we had a lot of Canadians and Americans and um, pretty much an even spread of women and men. The women made all the decisions. It was... As they should have. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we listened... (laughs) So um, you've been trained we well. Listened, we listened and followed. But it was fun, you know, um, and it gave me sort of an insight, uh, and I suppose an early fascination about what it'd be like to grow up in America and, and live in America. So maybe that was uh, where the first seeds were sown for my uh, interest in coming here. But back to your original question, I think, um, I think American women um, are stronger in spirit and soul and determination. Now... British women hearing this might not be not agree with me, but that was just my in, initial impression. Or I, I, I think what I gathered when I lived there is that I think American women tend to be a little more direct, but that's a cultural thing across the board there. Um, and I haven't lived there in 10 years, so things obviously have changed since I last lived there. Um, but I think that um, I felt more strident talk of equal rights and feminism here than I did when I lived there, um, although I knew many successful women there. So, um, you know, it may all be come down to cultural expression. Uh, so Mark and I um, met six years ago, and um, I moved here from England in, uh, when did I move here? 2009. And I hadn't lived here in a long time, so I thought, oh, wow, I better go meet a bunch of British people to make me feel at home because I haven't lived in the United States in a while, and my kids grew up in England, and I don't know, I've got to go meet some British people. So I joined the British American Business Council and um, was a member of that for several years. I'm now the president of it because I really love this group of people. Um, But I was asked to do a talk um, at a lunch, and it was about finance and so on and so forth. At the time, the Bonson Group was still at uh, Morgan Stanley, but in any event, uh, I went to give the talk, and Mark was in the audience. So that is how we met. Um, And I spoke about finance and my career, and, you know, Mark asked me a totally non-sequitur question. (laughs) Mark, what was the question? Well, before I get to the question, um, I just want to say that the first time I met you was on my fridge. Uh, <laughs> that's weird, but okay. <laughs> so I, I too moved to, um, I joined the BABC and um, and they had this mentor lunch with Kimberly Davis and with the, uh, the email uh, mailer that they sent out, there was a picture of Kim and um, there was just something in her expression that uh, in the photograph that fascinated me. So I went along to hear... Um, about her life because it, it said you know she's she lived and worked in England and there's a there's a brief overview of her career and I thought well, that would be really a fascinating thing to do at lunchtime so we had this <laughs> Kim gave this great um, account of her life um, 
from from Pittsburgh to to present day and at the time and uh, and I was just I was amazed I was amazed how someone had, could do so much you know raise three kids <laughs> have you, different careers um, and uh, at the very end there were some serious questions from various people and I I listened to all the serious questions and I I, I saw Kim countering some um, hard questions from certain gentlemen wearing sunglasses. It wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> the guy looked like he just came come from a card game in Vegas. Um, and then there was a big silence and it was like, any more questions? I'm like, I can't ask a serious question. So I said, Rolling Stones or Beatles? To which Kim replied, Rolling Stones. <laughs> And Which so, was good because and that's... So that was a match made in heaven at that point because we were both on the same page about the stones and from there you can build any kind of relationship. So we, um, you know, we met, we dated, and then uh, like a lot of people, and especially we are of a certain age, so t- time is of the essence. Uh, we started to live together, and um, and so that was really, you know, an interesting experience, right? Because I had been married before uh, one time for over 23 years, and um, as I Mark mentioned, I have three daughters with my ex-husband, who actually does live in London. Um, and you know, I that was my kind of a example of a relationship, and then also the financial aspect of how we related in that relationship. And so uh, Mark moved in, and we began to you know set up our house and. Decide, you know, have to start dealing with financial issues together uh, once we decided, you know, we were going to kind of stay living together. And so that brought in a whole host of issues, as financial issues often do, and, and can sometimes cause a bit of, um, you know, tension between people because they come at it, at least at the beginning, from different perspectives. So... You know, it's been an interesting ride, and we've had a lot of discussions, and we've had a lot of ups and downs um, financially. So I was still digging myself out of the, you know, Armageddon that was my divorce, and um, Mark was in transition with his career. So when we met, we were both in a lot of transition, um, which I think in many ways opened the opportunity for us to have conversation because nothing was like set in stone. So that was actually a good thing, even though when we went through it, it was kind of not that fun. Um, But we did have each other and somehow we, you know, managed to have fun in spite of the situation. So when I started this platform, as I said before, you know, I really am very passionate about the fact that women need to know what's going on. I was a person who uh, as I've mentioned before, was a corporate lawyer, an investment banker, a CFO. And yet during the course of my marriage, I lost complete control over the, the finances and the knowledge of the finances because I was overwhelmed with taking care of the children and, you know, my own uh, responsibilities and uh, trying to do some professional things. And so I really didn't know what was going on. And then, you know, when we finally did decide to... Um, dissolved the marriage, you know, I wasn't aware of a lot of things that were detrimental to me. And that was my fault. So I don't think it's, you know, we can all hide behind our responsibilities and say, I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do this. But in the end, it will really come back and bite you and you will be unhappy that you didn't know what was going on. And it doesn't have to be confrontational. There's nothing Machiavellian about this. This is just having knowledge. So I'm really strident about this. I, I've written a lot of things I you know that are pretty straightforward about women taking control. I really feel passionately about gender equity, not only in the workplace but in the home. And um, you know, I, I have some pretty uh, solid feelings about that. So I know that you like well, you have mentioned that you were married before, quite mm-hmm. young to Diane and you then you married Jill and You've had another relationship after that. Um, how did the financial aspect of those relationships, you know, uh, impact you? Or how were they, uh, how did they form you? And how are they different than what we're doing? That's well, well, a lot a, of questions. So no, they're you, all could, good. you can pick which one. They're all good questions. Um, obviously, I was a lot younger when I got married the first time. Um, and... Mixing that in with coming to America, you know, there's uh, there's a lot going on. But what one thing that um, 
that Diane and I both had when we met. We were both sort of on sort of an equal footing, um, so financially and uh, with our assets. So um, Diane wanted to keep her finances separate to me, and I was fine with that as well. Um, and uh, so we really we were very compatible on the financial side. We never had an argument about money, um, and we we split all of our costs. 50 50 and it just worked fine um and so diane was aware of the intricacies of the financial situation of she, your lives yeah and she was very informed um and uh she she had more i think was more responsible financially than me um and uh i was more of an adventure adventurous soul back then i think i still am but <laughs> you are darling you know. you're very adventurous but money wasn't um money wasn't necessarily part of the adventure adventure or the the purpose or the goal it was always um by default i would get paid well for doing great creative work so you know um, but it wasn't a point of contention in your relationship never, no never a point of contention um so then let's move on to yeah. jillian because i think that was a different kind of relationship <laughs> completely different so she was more, you were the breadwinner for the most part? Yes. And was she aware of the finances or not aware? Well, it's a, it's a strange dichotomy. Um, she was aware of accounting and being organized. So when we got married, she actually did all of the bookkeeping. She um, paid the bills. She paid and the bills. She kept the stuff. ledger. Right. Um, and we had a joint bank. We had a joint bank account. So you commingled all your funds. Commingled everything, um, and uh, so she was very organised. And uh, I was happy. In terms of a partnership, you know, I knew she was better at that than me, and was more interested in it. It was something she did with a passion. Um, and I just got on with, you know, my career at the time working for B&W and, uh, and doing, again, doing the best creative work I could do. And uh, I got paid well. And, uh, and, and Jill looked after the finances. You know, she looked after the money. So were you aware of what was going on? I was not. <laughs> <laughs> so did you, did you know what the credit card bills were and what, you know, what I, the finances I, of the monthly expenses were and things like that? I'm embarrassed to say, but honestly, hand on heart, I didn't because... You know, when you need, when you see that someone has an ability, uh, you trust them. You know, so well, I, I, don't, I don't think what you're saying is unusual. I think a lot of women take control of the uh, bills and they pay the bills. They handle all the household things, and you know, or a partner. For, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a man woman thing, but in a partnership, mm. often some one person will do that, and the other person kind of just. Not that they kick back, but they just think, okay, you know, it's being handled, and I don't really need to get into the nitty-gritty. So just FYI, everybody, you know, I address my commentary to women, but this is for everybody because it goes as, as much for men as it goes for women. Because if you don't really know in one part of your financial relationship what the heck is going on, then it, either way, it's not going to be good. So Jillian's handling all this stuff. So how did that end? I mean, what what happened that you weren't aware of that you should have been aware of? And what did you think about that? Well, one thing I realized is that ignorance is not bliss. Um, Amen. So, you know, I uh, once it became apparent that um, we, for some reason, we had no money in our bank account, you know, when, when I occasionally did check things. Um, then I was I was concerned, and, and you know, uh, Jillian had great taste in lots of things, and liked to buy clothes and shoes, and um, you know, we we were essentially living beyond the means of my salary, you know, what it could provide. So we were paid all our bills on time, and uh, she did that. But did you guys ever discuss it, or you never brought it up? It just kind of was floating around like, in the background. Again, my my bad. I just. Um, you know, it didn't go there. You know, I was. Well, really... I mean, I think in many relationships, people do not discuss this. It was an uncomfort. It was uncomfortable, I think, and that's why. You know, I always um, try to avoid conflict. You know, personal conflict, um, confrontations. I'm not a confrontational person. So you uh, associated talking about finances with it being confrontational. Yeah, I would sort of think, hmm, you know, I. She seems like she has this under control. She's got everything on lockdown. All the bills are being paid. 
um, you know. And a beautiful uh, shoe collection. <laughs> great shoe. Well, Julian always looks absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, so um, Imelda Marcus would have been proud of um, Jill's <laughs> shoe collection. <laughs> so... So you had these. So while you were doing that, I was um, married to my ex-husband Michael, and uh, we were living in New York uh, for a very long time, and then we moved to London. And um, you know, I kind of had uh, the reverse of that in some ways. Um, I always handled the bills. Um, the one time Michael tried to take them over, our cable got shut down because he forgot to pay the bill. Um, but I also did not. We ninety nine percent of the things that we argued about involved money, whether it was expenditures for the children or, um, you know, a vacation. I don't know, but we never really were philosophically aligned about money, and that was something we never discussed really when we started going out because we were both corporate lawyers in New York City in the eighties, and we both made good money, so we really didn't, you know, talk about it because I thought, oh, I'll just handle my stuff and he'll handle his stuff but then we had three children at which point i stepped out of the workforce and i uh stopped my progression in my career and i was a stay-at-home mom which was a real privilege and i'm very lucky that i got to do that but it did come at a price um but you know i think back to how i didn't want to discuss finances with him because it not only appeared to be confrontational to me, but it actually was because it caused a lot of aggravation in our home. And, you know, I was like, I would go buy things and I would like come in and hide them under the bed because I didn't want Michael to know. And I look back on that now and in retrospect and think, you know, how ridiculous, you know, if, if he and I actually had sat down and we had created a budget and we had discussed this openly, instead of kind of skirting around the issue all the time, we probably would have gotten along a lot better. I'm not saying we'd still be together, but I think we would have had less arguing. Um, so I think how maybe getting older, you become more sanguine about it. But um, what I'm trying to do is tell people who are young as well, you know, this is something that if you can become comfortable with it right away, it's going to really enhance your relationship. So when you and I met, um, we were kind of struggling along and, and mm. we were, you know, we were keeping a roof over our heads, doing what we needed to do. Um, and how, how, how do you feel when we talk about finances? Because we have recently gotten married and I was very clear, you know, how I wanted this to look because of all the things that had happened to me and also all the things I've learned it, from being a wealth manager and being uh, having my certified divorce financial analyst um, uh, designation and just the importance of just knowledge. Knowledge is power. So I've, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, that I wanted to have a cohabitation agreement, which we have, which mor- morphed into a prenuptial agreement. And in that agreement... You know, we had to discuss some uncomfortable things because it's basically talking about what happens if we no longer have a relationship. So that's already kind of a, uh, you don't really want to talk about that. But you kind of have to because if you don't, when you are finally falling apart, if you haven't decided things when you were in love with each other and happy, then you're really going to have a hard time of it. At least that's the theory. So I say this and people probably read it and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in reality, this is not an easy thing to do, fiscal feminist. So, you know, it sounds good on paper, but in reality, nobody really wants to do that. So I don't think you've had a prenup in any of your or cohabitation agreement in any of your other relationships. And I know that you did live with somebody for a very long time who wasn't your third wife, but, you know, Long term relationship. Long term relationship. Um, so, how did you feel when I said that this was like non negotiable? If I didn't have it, I wasn't going to get married or live together or do any of that stuff. So, how did you feel about that when I said it? Honestly, when I first said it, what were your thoughts? Well, I think it wasn't a surprise because of what we've been talking about all along and also knowing. Um, Knowing a couple of things: one, what you've gone through, how you know your your divorce, if you like, um, and the aftermath, how that had how that shaped your thinking, um, and uh, gave you a new awareness. So you know we've had many conversations over the years. So when it came to 
right, we're going to do this. We're going to get married. You know, it's going to be legal. And um, uh, yeah, no, it was, I suppose there was that unromantic element. Now we have to sign some legal documents. Um, and we talked about it, you know, there was a, there was a day or two where I felt, does this mean she doesn't really trust me? You know, yeah. because you, right now my head is in this sort of euphoric, we're getting married, you know, and I'm a... I'm Mark, a, uh, just FYI, everyone, Mark is way more of a romantic person than I am. He's fantastic that way. And I'm just an old curmudgeon, so... I love the, I love the, um, <laughs> there was a... Yeah, no, you're not. There was this great um, album by uh, Stanley Clark, uh, the bassist. Oh, it's called R Romantic Warrior, and uh, I remember, I remember thinking, you know, I'm not narcissistic, but we all have a little bit of it. But I thought I kind of want to be that person, you know, romantic warrior. I want to be romantic but tough. If that, if no. that makes any sense, <laughs> right? No, it does. So, so when, when the, um, well, we were in a time crunch too. Because we had to sign this document. We had to get it reviewed. Um, yeah, I mean, you really have to prepare and, and have it done in advance of the wedding. There's certain timelines. So yeah. if you are going to have a prenup or even, I mean, uh, what we have is a cohabitation agreement that has morphed into a prenup. But, um, you know, you really need to have a little bit of time in between doing it and, and the actual ceremony, the legal ceremony. Um, so you will have to get a lawyer and um, both of you will need to have your own lawyer so there is an expense involved in it but um that being said it's worthwhile i think and some of them aren't going to be you know unless you have you know significant significant assets they shouldn't be overly complex but clear enough to be a roadmap. but we did have one day where i could tell you know mark was not in a good mood and he was kind of you know not being particularly um friendly not unfriendly but he was a little standoffish and i said you know what's, or distant I think. yeah distant would be the word and i you know i was like so i locked myself in a room no you just <laughs> were barely talking to me and i was just like what's going on you know and um you know they're one of the the first lawyer he had spoken with was much more confrontational and he didn't you know he felt the way the prenup was written was really uh not good and so you know uh, towards mark and so we had to have a kind of a discussion about what my thoughts were, what his thoughts were, and then we had to go back to, um, uh, well, he got another lawyer um, who was actually more reasonable in price. Um, but then we went back to kind of, I guess we would say the negotiating table and kind of uh, changed a few things around. Because, you know, we both have our own individual careers and we both do other, you know, other things within our careers. But you know, maybe Mark goes on to invent a product that becomes, you know, super well known and successful. I don't know if I should be sharing in that unless, you know, it's a, uh, you know, if down the line, and we can always change this. So all those things needed to be considered. But I do think it, it we had to discuss the awkwardness a, a little bit. Mm. And uh, I think that's important to talk about. It, 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 it will be awkward for anyone, any couple um, discussing that, you know, um, but it has to be done. You know, it's, uh, it's important. It provides clarity. It's, um, you know, it's sort of a, it's like when you're negotiating, it sounds crazy, but you're negotiating a contract for a job and there's a, you know, you need to understand what, what happens at the other end, you know, if they decide to let you go, you know, negotiate a severance contract. Exactly. Uh, it's very important. So it's just trying to separate love and money, I suppose, you know, or love, money, assets, but love and money, those two things, um, and focus on the the what if, you know, it's like same with your car insurance, you know, it's great to say I'm a great driver, well, let's just drive, we don't need insurance, but you know, what if something unexpected happens, you know, um, and people do fall out of love, as I've found. Um, Multiple times. No, just kidding. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not proud of that at well, all. That's it's, nothing it's, not, it's I mean, we all have, at our age, if we haven't had multiple relationships, then there's something wrong with us, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it certainly gives you perspective. But I, how, do you think, um, would you, so would you prefer to be with someone who just doesn't want to know about this and you have complete control of it? Or do you think 
that a partnership and I'm not trying to, you know, make you say yes, but a partnership with somebody where both people are knowledgeable and you can sit down at the table, even if it's a little uncomfortable and have a conversation about it and come out with clarity. I mean, do which one gives you more peace of mind? Uh, I think having a prenup is essential. Um, it does because it's, it's, it sets everything out up front. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, each each party knows where they stand, and I think uh, I think it's the right thing to do. It's a modern thing to do. Did it make you love me any less, darling? No. <laughs> Did it make you love me any more? Well, you know, <laughs> yes, maybe. Um, of course, it's the right answer, Mark. <laughs> anyway, um, so let me ask you a question. Um, if you had any tips to give couples who are thinking about getting married, uh, who are together, going to live together forever, whatever. Um, how, what tips do you have for conversations about finances that make it more palatable? Um, do you think, um, you know, how is a good way to do this so that it is not only informative, and but it could maybe be fun and not so egregious that everybody dreads talking about it? Um. Good question. I think it depends on the age you are as well. Um, we're we're lucky that we're older and wiser, and we've um, we have a lot of experience, you know, of marriages and relationships and finances and uh, joint finances Good and times the, and bad the times. consequences of <laughs> right. and the consequences of um, you know hoping for the best um, and not having a plan in place for the worst, you know, and I think that's, uh, I learned from that. Um, so I think if you're a young couple, um, probably would be well advised to uh, have those conversations, obviously, as early as possible in the relationship um, and and have um, counseling, you know, have, have someone who can provide um, some guidance and, and help, and that, help and facilitate that discussion. That's a great idea. And, the, and you know, you can um, also do financial planning together. Um, right. You can get a financial planner. You can, um, you know, talk to a variety of financial advisors. But I, I think that's a great idea. I also think if you're going to do it, um, I've spoken to people who take uh, a weekend and they go somewhere nice to a nice resort or they go somewhere or they go ha have a nice dinner and the whole purpose of it is to talk about finances so that it's not you know two people sitting across the table from each other with daggers in their eyes saying you know i want this and you want that just you know embrace it enjoy it and have fun doing it um so you know and and it's all you know you just have to keep the romance alive whether you're talking about money or you're talking about your, you know, construction on your house or you're talking about your kids and or whatever problem is the problem of the day or the, the challenge of the day. But um, I think that um, compared to my first marriage, you know, we've had a, a much more open and honest discussion with each other about so many things. And I'm very grateful for that. I, I don't know if I am too. the first time around it was because I was young and you were young and it was the 80s and maybe people were just superficial and they never well, talked about anything. I don't know. You're eternally optimistic, aren't you? Yeah. So, when you're younger. Yeah. And I think it's really important for young men and women to understand that money is a means to an end. And if you have control of your money, you can really craft a nice life for you. But if, if, if the money starts controlling you and starts controlling your relationship or one person can't leave a relationship because they won't be able to survive without the money of the other or they don't know anything about it, then everything that was so beautiful becomes pear-shaped very quickly and all the good memories can get eradicated by that. So um, we, I think, have somehow circumnavigated this. Um, and, you know, like I said, it wasn't, all sunshine and lollipops throughout it all. You know, we've had to sometimes have some really honest discussions about about not only the cohabitation agreement, but, you know, our goals and desires and uh, how we both want to live and make a compromise, you know, about that. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us um, and to me and my followers so that they know that I haven't made you up, that you are actually real. I didn't Photoshop you into the picture and that... Um, we Photoshopped the pictures. <laughs> yeah, just so we didn't have so many wrinkles. Um, but it's been an absolute, 
you know, pleasure uh, having this relationship with you and and also, you know, helping me to kind of get my own stride and feel my own confidence and be with a person who is confident enough to allow me to be confident. And I think that was also lacking in my in my prior marriage. Um, it was not good for my self-esteem. And so on a non-financial note, you know, if someone doesn't build you up and be your partner and support you, then, you know, you've got to show that person the door. Um, so happy birthday again. Thank you very much. Um, I will make you a delicious dinner later. I'll put the champagne on ice. And we will go home and celebrate. Thanks very much, Mark, for joining us today. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, that's it's the been fisc- a pleasure. Thank you. That's a, a wrap. And this is The Fiscal Feminist signing off until next time. Thanks for listening. And uh, don't forget, be honest in your financial uh, conversations with your significant others. You will be so happy that you do it.